It's a beautiful sight. It's a beautiful sight. You may return to your seats. My, my, my. We have felt his presence. The glory of the Lord has filled this house. And we are here to worship him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You're going to leave here a changed person. I really believe that. You will leave a changed person. How many of you in the congregation were here last year? That's awesome. Awesome. We're so glad to have you returning, and we're so glad to have all of our first timers. It's so awesome. Thank you. I just want to welcome all of our guests, all of our visitors here tonight. You, you just have made our heart glad by coming and being here. And you ladies of the local church, you all know what I think about you. You are the best. I love our BC ladies. Give them a hand tonight. Give them a hand tonight. You know, we have several visitors, and I hate... I hate to do this, but we are privileged tonight to have our national WE president of the Assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ from Michigan, all the way from Michigan. She came to her conference. Sister Scott, would you stand? Give her a hand. She has been a wonderful, wonderful friend to me. If you are a pastor's wife, would you stand? If you are a pastor's wife. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And we have wonderful speakers lined up for this conference. Uh, you that have traveled much lately, I know I have, and I know I've been stuck here and there and everywhere and just got in last night about 10. So... I know how that is, but Sister, don't fret. Sister Williams will be here tonight, and Sister Chesser will be here tonight. They will be coming, but we have Sister Christy Adams with us tonight from Memphis. She'll be speaking. Would you stand? Give her a hand. I just get so excited seeing all of you ladies. It just makes my heart glad. Uh, you know, there's a lot of times when people in the Bible, if they just could get close to a friend, they could gain strength and courage, and they felt like traveling on. Well, that's the way I feel tonight when I get next to all of you ladies. It just makes me so happy. I saw two groups come in from Louisiana. You all made me so happy. When I saw you, Sister Hunt and her group, I just started names. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I'm here to introduce our speaker for tonight. She is no stranger to this church or this conference. She was with us last year. And what a tremendous blessing Sister Bonnie Marshall was to us last year. <clears throat> Let me give you a little history. Dr. Bonnie Marshall has a Ph.D. in counseling and a master's degree in psychology. She has established Mental Health Matters Ministries in several churches and cities in the U.S. She speaks at conferences all over the country. She has, has been board-certified counselor for over 27 years. 
She's also adjunct professor of psychology at CLC Stockton, California, and at Pathway USA. She and her husband are now pastoring a church in New York City. I envy you. You all know what a blessing she is. What a blessing she is. She speaks very concise. Uh, she speaks with confidence. And she, she just has the ability to captivate you. As if you haven't heard her before, you will soon learn. She captivates you and she just draws you in. And you're just there soaking it all up. And that's the way I feel tonight. She helps, she encourages, she inspires. And you know, when I think of Sister Marshall, Sister Bonnie, I think of a true Christian lady. And I could not give her a greater compliment than that. She is a true Christian lady. And I want you to stand and give a Mississippi welcome to Sister Bonnie Marshall. You. Praise God. So, uh, <clears throat> whoever wants to switch places with me with New York, I will give you my flight ticket. I'll stay in Mississippi where everybody's Christian. <laughs> I'm not laughing at that. Everybody is Christian I mean, at some level. York is different. Nothing would keep me there except a burden for those that do not know Jesus, and there's plenty. Very different. Very different from Louisiana, Alexandria, where I'm from. <laughs> My goodness, yes. But um, God called us there, and um, actually, it better be God that <laughs> called us there. <laughs> <laughs> you sure about this, the Lord? Oh, my goodness. Anyway, yeah, God called us there. My husband and I have had visions, prophetic words. We spoke to my pastor, Brother Mangan, in, um, at my home church in Alexandria. And, and the day we spoke to him about New York City, my husband, who's not a crier, I mean, he can be moved deeply, but he's not a crier. I'm the one who loses it every <clears throat> he started crying while he was talking about his vision and burden for New York City. And then Brother Mangan started crying. <laughs> they both were just sitting there crying. And I'm thinking, okay, I guess I'm going to New York City. <laughs> there are two grown men who are not crying. They're crying. <laughs> Talk about manipulate. No, I'm just. It's a, <laughs> and um, we're there, and I thought, oh, I ain't nobody's gonna want God. I mean, really, uh, New York. Well, we've been there just a few months. It's a baby church, and people have been knocking on the door every day. Every day. Every day. Just. Not, not knocking on the door to collect taxes or knocking on the door to arrest somebody, but just knocking on the door and saying, are you the pastors that have moved? Well, can we come in because we need some help or we need to talk to someone and we need you to pray with us, you know, or this thing has happened and that has happened. And there's all kinds of stuff happening there. It's York. And people are coming in. Last night we had two women just in the neighborhood, knocking on our, uh, uh, we, God has blessed us with a home in New York City and banging on the door and I'm thinking, oh God, please, this is the city of drive-by shooting, I'm just kidding, but no, I'm not kidding, but, um, and, and, and they were, and, and I, and my husband opened the door and this woman was crying and saying, my friend and I, we, we heard you were, I don't know, you, you religious people, and I'm like, yeah, he is. <laughs> you know, and my dog is growling, and, 
and and they, they we need help. We just want you to pray for us. Now they want to come to church every Sunday. Both of them last night they were at the house till 10, 10 they came they stayed for four or five hours. They they went home at ten o'clock at night and. And in, the, in that, we prayed with them. We talked about my husband. If he gets a chance to talk about baptism, he says, you know. And he will talk about it. Now they both want to be baptized in the next few days. And, you know, I mean, I tell you what. Wherever you're at, if you're a Christian, there is light. There is light. God has put that in you. And you can shine it in the darkest of neighborhoods, in the darkest of cities. In the darkest of situations, in your own family, if you are. Yes, that was the greatest compliment anyone could have paid, paid me. That I am a Christian woman. Forget the rest, just I'm a Christian. So there's light. That means there's no excuse to meld or to, to mesh with the darkness. I've got to stand out. I'm a city on a hill. People are going to look to me to you and go what's that in that dark what's that that looks like a this distant shining whatever what is that i need that you can do it yes but there are things that we need to do to keep shining though you know we need to we need to do some things to maintain that shine that light that salt so we don't lose the saltiness I know, I'm sorry I'm making you stand so long, but media, thank you so much. Uh, I always respect and appreciate media and the music department. You know, they come and they give and they give and they give. Very seldom do they receive, but they give, and they're such so sacrificial. Media, Philippians 3.13, we're going to go to Philippians 3.13. I'm going to talk to you about breaking a yoke of unforgiveness tonight. Can anyone see me? <laughs> because I'm thinking, you know what I'm doing here? I'm, I'm standing on my tippy toes. I'm actually doing this. There was one church. I went there and it was kind of, it was tall, just like this. And I was standing there and I don't know what the pastor felt, but he came and gave me a little step. I was like, what is that? He's like, well, that's for you to step on. And I'm like, now everybody's really going to believe I'm short. You <laughs> don't show me up. <laughs> but I actually used it. <laughs> anyway, so can you see me? <laughs> Is it just a talking thing? Philippians 3.13. Brethren. It was so powerful. Every time I read this, it just moves me. I count not myself to have apprehended. Paul is saying, look, I don't know everything. That's, that's what it means. I don't count myself that I understand everything. This is Paul. I'm thinking he understands everything. But he said, no, I don't think I've apprehended or I understand. Or I don't count myself that I got everything. But this one thing I do. And every time somebody says, there's one thing I'm interested. Because I don't want ten things to do. One thing is good. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Pastor, sister, and, 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 and the committee that organized the HER conference, I am so honored and privileged that you would count me in and that you would get me to come here. We're a team. This weekend is, I believe, God showed me this. It's going to be revelatory and healing at the same time. Every speaker, I've prayed for everyone that speaks, that I know who's speaking what, and I've prayed for them. I'm telling you, God is going to use these speakers to give revelation and, and healing. God's going to pour out the healing and strength and peace for the journey. The journey is still there. Many of us, the journey is long. But we're going to receive strength for the journey. Amen. Everybody say, leave which is behind. Say it again. Say, forget which is behind. And reach forth which is before. 
If you cannot leave the stuff behind, you will not be able to reach for the new stuff before. Yeah. You cannot run the race with a, a ball and a chain, you know? It's hard. You'll stumble and you hurt yourself. You may be seated. Thank you for standing so long. Shouldering pain. Shouldering pain from the past is spiritually unnatural. It's not natural. We're not wired. We are human clay. Amen? And we're not built or wired with the capacity to foster bitterness. You're thinking, where is this going? Well, hopefully, the Holy Ghost will show up. Our mind, well, the Holy Ghost has already shown up in the worship. <laughs> but our minds cannot take and our hearts cannot hold this kind of weight. I've talked to people, I talk to people actually every day. Monday to Friday was my original counseling schedule. Now it's Saturday and I have a feeling it's encroaching on Sunday now. It's, you know, and I love, I love what I do. I do and I love the people I see. I love people. So otherwise I wouldn't do what I do. If I didn't love people, it would be too much. But and, and I've spoken to people, they say, you know, I don't know what it is. I'm a Christian. I've got the Holy Ghost. I go to church. I'm involved in ministry. You know, I, I, why am, do I feel hedged in? Why do I feel this darkness around me? I'm a Christian. I, I, I have his spirit. I know God. I've seen miracles in my own home, my own family, my own lives. But why is it there is a feeling of, of, of a weight that I carry, a spiritual heaviness? We are not fit to carry such spiritual heaviness that is a direct result of bitterness. Have you ever felt like dark things are around you? And no matter how hard you pray, and I believe in prayer. I live prayer. I believe in it. I love it. That's how we communicate with God. Prayer and the word. And, but have you ever felt that no matter how hard you pray, and, 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 but th this, dark, this dark feeling, this feeling of discomfort, this feeling of anxiety is, is not leaving. It's not left yet. You feel constantly pressured. I call it feeling like you're hedged in. Dealing with hurt, anger, and temptation to set things right is what causes it. If you feel that you've been hurt to the point where you cannot sleep but think about the person that has hurt you and all you do is you want to set it right. You want one opportunity to confront and set it right. I'm telling you, you're not free. You're not free. You're not free. You cannot change people. My friends, you cannot change people. You cannot fix them. Stop trying to fix people. Stop trying to change people. Stop trying to make people like you more. Stop trying to make people love you or be your buddy. You cannot, but you can change your response to people that have hurt you. You can change your response to others that have done you wrong. The only person you can change is yourself. And that's easy. You live with yourself. Do whatever it takes to change your response. Do whatever it takes to change your attitude. Do whatever it takes to clean out your heart. But stop trying to fix others and make them nicer to you. If they are nicer to you, well, wonderful. But if they are not, move on. Leave it behind. Go for what's in front of you. Leave that ball and chain behind. Don't carry it around. It's not you. You cannot be a light. You cannot be a city set on a hill if you're weighted down. Well, actually, that is the point of my whole teaching today. We all now can go and have pizza, I guess. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> because if I say I'm done, I think she's going to throw something at me. Um... Acknowledging, acknowledging the lasting feelings of anger and bitterness and even vengeance, the, you know, the wounds from friends and loved ones and acquaintances. You know, the Mayo Clinic, I, uh, the, the reason I appreciate the Mayo Clinic is they've got very, very articulate articles by even Christian psychologists. I am a psychologist, but I'm a Christian first. 
So I like to read articles that, that, uh, that are psychologically oriented, but they have a Christian faith-based um, uh, underlying thing. I'm not saying that I, I have read non-faith-based things that have not um, uh, enlightened me. Yes, I have. I have, and some of them have been great. But the Mayo Clinic warns that when you live in the past... When you live in the past, refusing to release trespasses and practice forgiveness, you are the one that pays more dearly than anyone else. The person that has hurt you has moved on, has moved on, has a new life, maybe married somebody else. They're not thinking about you. You are. You've got to just erase them from your life. Erase the thing. It's hard. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not just saying, well, go home and erase it and tomorrow you'll wake up and they'll all be bright. It is a process. But we serve a God of miracles and a God of process. Yes. And so God can, through a miraculous process, bring us to the end of that tunnel. There is poison in bitterness and blame and unable to face the anger and confront embittered issues people allow an unforgiving attitude to cause distress with their souls it is like poison destroying the heart and the mind forgiveness is one of the most difficult issues to tackle in one's heart you know why because we really 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 feel that whoever hurt us owes us and when we forgive, or when we even try to forgive, we're thinking we're giving them a pass. Forgiveness is not giving them a pass. No, no, no. Jesus does not give us a pass when he forgives. He looks at, at our sin squarely in the eye. He looks at it and calls us out and says, you have sinned. But I, because I love you, am canceling that sin. I am erasing it. I'm not giving you a pass. I'm not calling a truce. God doesn't call truth. He's not our equal. He doesn't say, well, I'll lay down my weapons and you lay down yours and we'll call it a, cru a, a truce. You know, I will, I'll close an eye and I will, uh, you know, uh, not, I will ignore what you've done so that we can live together in harmony. That's not how God deals with us. God has never ignored sin. Never, and he never will because he's holy and he's a good God. But what God does is that he will look at the sin and say, Hey, you have sinned. Now go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. That's what he does. That's what he does. I will not condemn you. I'm not going to gossip about you and tear your reputation down over cups of coffee or green tea. I like coffee, but I can't stand the other stuff. <laughs> For me, anything that's green has gone off. <laughs> green, sorry, if you like green tea, I'm sure it's working for you, but <laughs> I hope it is. But we get together and we're like, well, you know what he did? Well, you know what? God's got him. God's going to get him. And God that's bitterness. That's bitterness. I'm not saying that you are that you that you should be non-human about it. We're human. So we feel rage and anger and you know wanting to get back. But if you keep talking about it every Thanksgiving, that all you can talk about at Thanksgiving and Christmas is how bad they did you. Well, happy Thanksgiving, I guess. And you chase people away and people are like, can we not go to our aisle? Because all the time we sit down before the turkeys, even she's giving a speech about everybody done bad. You know what I'm saying? Enough. There's an entire life of abundant joy and strength. Listen, there are cities filled with people that do not yet have the Holy Ghost, that are not baptized, they're not saved. They, there are cities in this world that haven't even heard the name Jesus. And we're sitting around with our relatives, tearing down people that have torn us down. God's got it, folks. God's got it. He is your vengeance. He's got it. He sees he sees the way you were treated. He sees what's happening. He sees how you've suffered. He's not forgotten. 
but he wants you to change tactics. He wants you to walk another way, his way. My goodness, can you imagine if the pages of the gospel was all about Jesus moaning about how people treated him bad? Man, I went to that city and after all the miracles I did, they just slapped me around and they threw stones at me and they drove me away. Man, I never want to go back. He never said that. He just kept moving. He just kept moving. I need to save these that you have given to me. I need to keep moving. You are light and you are salt. And if you allow bitterness in your life and all you're doing year after year after year, month after month, week after week with your friends, relatives, and your poor husbands, if all you're doing is just... You're going to drive people away. And your children are going to begin to believe that holding a grudge is normal. Because all you're doing is you're talking about everybody else. And your children are listening and saying, huh, mom's doing it. It wouldn't be great if they heard you just praise God every day. All the sound that they hear at home is the sound of intercession and prayer and thanksgiving. Can you imagine the mental health that your children will grow up with? You know, in counseling, when I talk about stuff like this, like they, they look at me, my client, not all my clients are, you know, uh, Holy Ghost filled people, you know, a bunch of them are and a bunch of them are not. I see everybody and some of them look at me and I'm like, I thought you were a psychologist. And I'm like, I am. Well, you sound like a preacher to me. <laughs> well, I'm a traveling psychologist. <laughs> I'm a preachy psychologist. <laughs> so please leave your payment on the table before you don't skip. <laughs> Actually, that was not a joke. Just, people come to me, I'm telling you, I, I, th- I think I said that last time I was here at her. You know, people come to me just to get scolded sometimes. I don't know why, you know? They just come, they get scolded, and then they pay me and they go. It's a good life. <laughs> you know? I don't, I don't mean that bad, but, you know, seriously, I, it's, it's common sense stuff, but they want to they wanna hear somebody, I don't know, with, with some credentials say it, I get, okay, I'll say what your mama's been trying to tell you for 30 years, sure, yeah, just pay me and I'll tell you, and when you come next week, I'll tell you the same thing, your money. Ladies. Maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot, but you really don't need, uh, I mean, yes, we, 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 counseling is a wonderful thing and everything. Of course, you know, I believe it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. But, you know, you don't really need long-term therapy. You just need to get a hold of what God would have you do. You know, just get a hold of Jesus. Yeah, that's your long-term therapy right there. Be full of the Holy Ghost. He'll lead you give you revelation by refusing to forgive someone who has sought your forgiveness now we're going to go into different areas now but by refusing to forgive someone who has actually sought your forgiveness someone whose actions show deep remorse and repentance or even if you don't know whether they have repented or remorseful you know they just well, I'm sorry by refusing to forgive such a person you will experience maybe a momentary taste of satisfaction no I'm not going to forgive you. You don't get away that easily. You might, you know, experience a taste of satisfaction born out of revenge, but you feel you're the one, you're sort of one up on the offender, but the truth is you're stuck. Yeah, understandably, there are many who have valid reasons to seek revenge. It is true. I'm going to say it. There are many who have valid reasons to revengefully keep that bitterness. They have valid reasons. It's not healthy They feel it's valid, but retribution cannot heal you. 
Releasing a debt owed to you has the power to actually heal you and give you that joy. If you are going through anxiety, not all anxiety is a cause of unforgiveness, is, is caused by unforgiveness. But if you're going through certain kinds of anxiety or depression and you don't know why because you're praying, you're doing all the right things, check. Check your, ask God to shine the light on your heart to check whether there is pockets and spaces there. You have not released someone from something you suffered. Or whether you're still blaming someone. Listen, there might be a bunch of people to be blamed. I'm sure there is. If you've been abused, if you've been abused mentally, emotionally, spiritually, sexually, if you've been abused, you've been hurt, there might be some people that you have the, you have the right to say, you know, you they did it. But if you don't move on from this part and you don't own up to whatever you could have contributed to the situation, if you did not contribute anything and you were innocently uh, a part of that circumstance and you were abused, then you, your job right now is to leave that behind and reach forth. If you don't, then it's your fault that you are not growing. It is your fault that you are still suffering from anxiety and depression. It is. It will be your responsibility. They may have brought you here, but from here onward you have got to take yourself let's lift up your hands our hands if you agree with this let's lift up look towards God right now and say God give me revelation shine your light in my heart if there are pockets of darkness in my heart if there are spots that I have not released completely. It could be a family member. It could be a church member. It could be a leader. It could be somebody, you know, a, a best friend, a co-worker. It could be my own children, my spouse, my husband. It could be an ex-husband. Then Father, shine that light on me right now. Show me and reveal to me. And if I feel I've really forgiven them, but still there are moments I'm still tempted to talk about it, tempted to destroy them. And anytime I hear that they have gone through some success, I can't sleep. It bothers me when if somebody, if somebody's success bothers you, check your heart. If the person that has hurt you, if, I don't care if it's, you know why they're called an ex? Because that's what they are. They've been X'd out of your life. Why are you making them part of your present life? The more you talk about them, you make them part of your present. They're gone. Let them go. Release yourself. I'm sorry that happened to you. I'm sorry that the relationship didn't work out. I'm sorry whatever he did, she did, or whatever, whoever did. But you need to get to a place... Where you understand that retribution and talking about it endlessly. I'm not talking about, I'm not referring to talking to a counselor or a pastor or a safe person about it. You can talk to safe people about it. But if you're talking to the entire crowd sitting on the right, on the, on the fourth aisle. Every Sunday. Now they've switched churches because you. They don't want to come around anymore. Oh, no. She keeps talking about that daughter-in-law of hers. I can't do it anymore. I just, I'm losing my mind. Right in the middle of worship. I'm trying to focus on Jesus and she's focused on the daughter-in-law. Please. Forgiveness is hard. Particularly in dealing with divorce or loss of love, loss of dreams. Some of us here, you've lost dreams because somebody decided to trample on your dreams and walk away in the middle of a good, what you thought could have been a good relationship. They walked away and they deceived you and did something wrong, something horrible. And so you've lost love and you've lost your dreams of a good future. It's difficult to let stuff like that go because where there's emotional and maybe even financial investment in a relationship and all of a sudden they trample all over your investment, that's not easy to forget because you've invested, you've put in time, you've put in energy, you've raised kids, you've cleaned the house, 
You've put in finances to buy a home. And all of a sudden, they're tired of you. And when you hear that they are doing good, you just, you put that video in your mind. I was talking to a lady just this past week. And there's a video in her mind. Every time she hears that her ex-husband is doing okay, he's been promoted, or he's met somebody new, or he's driving a new car, she can't, she'll call me. And I'm like, listen, I see you every Thursdays, okay? I don't want to talk to you Monday, Tuesday. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. Do it. I think it. I'm telling you. You said that you wanted to be a psychologist, and I'm thinking, no. <laughs> no, you lose all joy. No, I'm just kidding. You wouldn't. But <laughs> you need extra Holy Ghost, that's for sure. I need more, more time in prayer than most people. Y'all, 15 minutes, Jesus is in you. Me, one hour later, I'm still begging God to <laughs> help me. And so, you know, she plays these videos in her mind of when I see him, this is how it's going to be. If I see him at a traffic stop, I'm like, no, not at a traffic. What are you going to do in about two minutes? If I see him at Walmart, I've got the whole script. <clears throat> One lady told me, she said, I invested money. I invested everything. I gave up. You wouldn't believe how much. She actually told me how much. I was like, whoa. Man. And, and she was like, yeah, to put him through school and, and, and he's successful, everything. And it was truth. She was not exaggerating. It was truth. She gave up a lot and, and invested a lot. And then one day he told her, I don't love you anymore. And I'm going away with somebody else. Okay, so she comes to see me and everything. And so she said, <clears throat> I'm moving. I'm like, okay. You mean you, you, bought, another, you bought a new home? She said, not yet, but I, I'm, I'm really planning on it, and I'm moving. I'm, I need to get out of my zip code. And I'm like, why? I said, because he's moved there. He's next door to you? No. Well, where is he? He's like, I don't know, 10, 12 houses away. Okay. So you're selling your home. And you're going to buy a new home, pack, which I... I detest packing. And you're going to pack all those boxes, everything. You're going to uproot your kids from that neighborhood and their friends. Go somewhere far away because he's moved there. Yeah. Wow. How much more power, lady, are you going to give to this man? How much power are you going to give away to somebody else to control you to the point that you would sell up, pack up, and leave because he's, he doesn't even know where you live. He doesn't know because she's already moved before. So she, he didn't. And I said, have you seen him? No, I just heard from a family, a mutual family member and a friend that he's bought a house and he's moving there with you know who. And I'm like, huh. Well, at least you can get a clear shot. <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I'm sorry. You know what's happening? I've lived in New York. See, see, I'm getting that New York mindset. No, I'm, that criminal, no, I'm just kidding, but, man, he's rubbing off on me. I've got to go talk to my husband. I'm saying, I'm sounding like a gangster, man, come on. And so, and I said, are you, you, you you've got to be joking. She said, no, I can't, I can't, you know, I'm going to be driving and I'm going to be passing by the house. What is he, is, what is he, is he hanging in the front door? What, 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 you passing by a house? Are you seeing? No, but I know they are there. I said, listen, I cannot stop you from whatever you want to do. I'm just your therapist. I'm just like a GPS. I'll give you direction. You have to decide to follow. That's my policy. But let me tell you this. If you keep giving him power to control you like that, there's not far enough you can move. It's not. That there's no way you could go to escape this. You're not going anywhere to escape him. You're going away to escape your own thoughts. And your thoughts will follow you everywhere you go till your, to your grave. 
She said, well, I can't live there. I said, try it. She said, are you telling me? I said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Stay there for three months. And if you, are, you cannot do it anymore and you're having nightmares, fine, you can move. But as your doctor, I'm asking you, stay there for three months. Toughen up. Pass that house. And praise God every time you pass that house. She's still living there. He's moved. <laughs> Prayer and praise works. <laughs> no, he's moved. I don't know. He's moved because I don't know why he's moved. But that's what I heard. That's what I heard. He said, she, she said, oh, you know, he's moved and he's going somewhere else. He's actually moved to another state. And I'm like, ooh, <laughs> your praise is powerful. <laughs> don't be praising in front of my house because I don't understand. <laughs> And blame works in the same way as bitterness. Blame, you know, causes vicious cycles of pain and sorrow. So you have bitterness because, you know, the, the, uh, um, keeping all those bad feelings because somebody has hurt. Blame is, who can I blame for my situation? You know, I'm going to blame my, my mom, my grandma. And, and, you know, I understand about abuse and abandonment. Of course I do. Th that's what I do. That's what I, I counsel every day. I understand how that works and I understand the hurt that it can bring you and the heaviness. But let me tell you, blame is where instead of just saying, you know what, I'm responsible for my happiness. I'm responsible for how strong I am with the Lord. I'm responsible whether I have a prayer life or I don't have a prayer life. I'm responsible if I have the joy of the Lord or not. I'm responsible of how much Holy Ghost is in me or how little or how backslidden I am. I'm responsible. I am no longer going to blame my mother, my grandma, the ex, the neighbor, my boss, the ex-pastor, the pastor's wife, or church people. I am not going to blame. The blame game is just sickening. That means you don't want to take responsibility for your own life. Because it's easier to blame the devil or we blame the devil. So let me tell you something. The devil is not omniscient. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent and he's not omnipotent. The devil is not everywhere at the same time. So I'm sorry. Some of your problems, the devil wasn't involved. Because he's not everywhere at the same time. If I got a bad hamburger, it's not the devil. I don't know. Maybe it's the cook. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just my day. It is what it is. That's life. Yes, it is. We just have got to, I hate saying this word because it doesn't even sound pretty good. Suck it up. Now I've said it. Is this on Facebook? No, is it really? Because you know... Man, I'll get all kinds of text messages. Oh, Sister Marshall, I can't believe you said Well, I know. I can't believe I've said it either. So, I was not in my right mind. I blame my mind. It's not me. It's my mind. I'm not responsible. <sighs> scripture says, you know, bl blame. Blame, blame, blame. Oh, I love the scripture. He says, who, he who covers a transgression... It means if somebody does something wrong, you kind of, you know, you don't talk about it. Just, I'm not saying don't, if it's, if it's a transgression, it's going to hurt a lot of people. You go to a leader and, and discuss it. How best to redeem. Are you doing things to redeem people or get them out? Everything Jesus did was redemptive. Everything. Even when he exposed sinners and he scolded the Pharisees, everything he did, he wanted them saved. Everything he did when he dealt with that adulterous woman that was caught in the act of it, everything he did and said was redemptive. Is everything you're, is everything you're doing redemptive or is it just you want some people just out of your life? So you will say or do anything to get them out. If you're not redeeming even the worst kind of people, then we don't have enough Holy Ghost. Not everything I've said has been redemptive in my life. I've made mistakes. Not everything I've done has been redemptive. 
There's things that I've done and said that I'm ashamed of and I've repented of it because it was not redemptive. It was just a, you know. But scripture says, he who covers a transgression and says, you know what, let's not talk about what he did. It's, you know, I know what he did was bad, but let's not, can we not? Let's pray for that man. Let's pray for that woman. Let's pray for that child. Yes? He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. What is the motive of repeating a matter? Because we want help or we want to separate? We want to power up. We want people to, you know, kind of back up our side of the story. So that's why we're repeating it because we want a team that will just say, she's right. He's bad. Don't do that. You don't need a team. You have Jesus. With him, you're a majority. You don't need a team. You don't need to power up. You don't need to say, you know, can you support me in this and, and start canvassing? Well, I mean, come on. This is not a political party. Yes? By repeating the matter and continually blaming the offender, the offense will only get bigger and larger in your own mind. The more you talk about it, the bigger the offense will get. The deeper your anxiety will be. Now, when you talk to a counselor about it, a good counselor, a counselor that has Holy Ghost will actually lead you to a place of healing. If you talk to a pastor about it, he leads you to a place of healing, a place of strength, a place of recognizing who is really Lord in your life and what you need to lean on. But if you keep talking to people that will agree with you, stop trying to gather people that will always and only agree with you and will be too scared to tell you where and what to do to change. You don't need friends that are just yes people. Oh yeah, I mean, you're right. Oh my goodness, you're so amazing. I agree with you. I don't trust people like that because I don't agree with me sometimes. No, I don't. I don't agree. Sometimes I don't agree with me. You know, my husband and I, we've had conversation. He said, you just said something. And I'm like, yeah, honey, I did. Do you agree with that? What do you mean? Well, do you agree with what you just said about that situation? Not really. It just felt good to say it. Are you judging me? He's like, no, I'm just, I'm just wanting to know. Do you really agree with that? Are you, are you now go? And this is it. This is what we do. We'll gather friends and we'll only have friends that would agree with us. They will never have the courage to expose our evil thoughts. They will never have the courage to expose our, our, our weaknesses and our gossip. A good friend will say, hey, I love you. Jesus loves you. You've got enough Holy Ghost to now shut your mouth. And don't go down that path because you will lose. And I love you enough. I'm going to bar the doors until we pray this through. We're not going to have a party about this. This is so good for me. You know what it is? I've been, I've been just bottling up so much of anger, I think. This last couple of weeks, I've been talking, counseling certain people that I've just wanted to... Never mind, but... You know, just one or two people that I've just want... So I'm thinking, I know what I'll do. I'll go to Pot's camp <laughs> and get some therapy, you know? So if I'm screaming and shouting, it's not because I think you're deaf. I think it's because I need to vent. I, I, just, I just need to get it all out. My goodness, I feel good already. I don't know about you, but I feel better. <laughs> I feel great. Thank you. You all are good therapists. Forgiveness is a choice. Everybody say that with me. Forgiveness is a choice. Jesus chose not to condemn the woman caught in adultery. He chose to not condemn her. He chose to forgive her. But he also gave her truth. He didn't just give her grace. A lot of people use the story as God's grace. Yes, the grace was, I don't condemn you. The truth was, don't do it again. He says, go and don't do it again. Sin no more. Okay, so he gave grace and truth. Jesus did not ignore the reality of the woman's transgression. He didn't say, don't worry about it. I know you didn't do it. He didn't say that. He said, don't do it again, which means I know you did it. 
What they caught you for? You're guilty, lady. I know you did it, but I am not going to punish you for it. I'm not going to condemn you for it. I'm just going to lead you to do better. That's redemptive. Amen? He acknowledged that she did indeed sin, but he chose not to condemn it. And as God, he had the right to indemnify her. Scripture shows me that as flawed, sinful human beings, I do not have, and you do not have, her conference, you do not have the moral right to hold grudges or bitterness towards others, and only honest acknowledgement of the bitterness puts you on the road to achieving peace and emotional balance, as well as discerning the mind of Christ. You want to discern the mind of, I do. Who wants to discern the mind of Christ? I want to know exactly what God is thinking about certain things. Yeah, there are some things he's going to re not reveal to me, but because... It may not be time yet or whatever, but, oh, I might not be ready to receive that revelation from God or whatever, but I want to be able to discern what God thinks about this city, that city, this neighborhood, this person. I need discernment in these last days. If there's anything I need other than the Holy Ghost, it's the gift of discernment. I need to discern the spirits because many false prophets have gone into the world. But let me tell you this. I cannot discern if my mind is clouded with bitterness and blame. The tough truth of the situation is that it's not that you won't forgive, or rather it's not that you cannot forgive. There's one lady that she told me, in fact this lady that didn't want to live in that zip code because the ex-husband moved there. She said, I can't forgive what he did. I said, lady, it's not because you cannot forgive, you will not forgive. Forgiveness is a choice. It's in your hands to forgive. You just won't. You're choosing not to. Don't say cannot like it's out of your control. It's not out of your control. Otherwise, Jesus would not have told us to pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. He said that. He taught us to pray that way because he knew that it is in our control to forgive. We can choose to forgive. Amen. Amen. It's not, I can't let it go. You won't let it go. Releasing spiritual debt. I want you to do this right now. Everyone here, you've got that little pretty satin bag that you would have collected. If you don't have it, please don't run through that door and try to get one. But if you don't have a bag, inside the bag is a pen and a notebook. If somebody beside you or behind you does not have a bag, would you do me a favor and share just a piece of paper, just a tear, up, tear off a piece of paper from that bag? Can someone tear off and give me one, please? Can I have one, please? Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Just one piece of paper, just one piece. I want you to have it. If somebody doesn't have it, you share, share a piece of paper with them. I'm going to do a, I'm going to do something with you tonight. And then we're going to let the Holy Ghost move on some of us. Amen. Has this helped somebody here? Who has it helped here? I know it's, it's helped me because I've had bitterness in my heart about certain things, certain situations that have happened in my family. I've had bitterness in my heart, and that's when this, this whole message was birthed from my own experience of blaming and holding that bitterness. But God had to clean my heart, and I know he can do that for you tonight. The first thing is this. You don't have to write it down. Just, just leave, that, leave that paper. You don't have to write it, anything right now. I'll tell you what to do with that paper. When you start looking at the sin committed against you as a debt, someone has sinned against you and now owes you a spiritual debt. Anyone who sinned against a child of God, they owe you. Okay, you may or may not agree with this, but they do. They owe you. It's how you take care of what they owe that matters. What do you do with what they owe? Okay. Step one is to separate the spiritual debt that they owe you from your anger. 
You separate the debt from your anger. Not easy. But with prayer, you go to God and say, God, separate my anger from what they owe me. So I can clear-mindedly take care of what they owe me. Amen? We, we are not, sometimes it's difficult to separate that anger. And that's why when we think of what they owe you, you get angry. And it disturbs your mind. And you become anxious, depressed, and full of rage and fear. The second thing you need to do is you have to confront a victim mentality. I'm going to be speaking more about that tomorrow as well, victim mentality. The victim mentality is one way. It is always someone else's fault. I already said about how blame is as poisonous as bitterness. Okay, two things. Bitterness is poisonous and blame is poisonous. A victim mentality is where you blame. It's always somebody else's fault for bad things happening. It could be somebody else's fault for some bad things happening to you. If somebody broke into your house and stole your stuff, it is that person's fault. And it is right to blame the thief for doing it. But if you blame everybody for every bad circumstances, then you've got to check whether you have a victim mindset. That's a victim mindset. That means everything bad that goes wrong, somebody else did it. We need to own our contribution to the situation. Own up to what I could have done to make it worse or what I did not do to make it better. Own up. Amen? Everybody say, own up. Own up. Say, I need to own up to on my part. My part in the whole situation. The most effective way to overcome the victim mentality is to start taking responsibility for every action and circumstance in your life that you had directly contributed. As you seek in every possible way to take responsibility for your own life, it is my responsibility, as I said earlier, to be full of the Holy Ghost. It's my responsibility to have the joy of the Lord. It's my responsibility to get healed. If I'm not healed, I, I'm, I'm shirking my responsibility of seeking healing. I can't keep blaming the boss and the neighbor and the mother-in-law because I'm not healed. Amen? I need to go for gold. I need to pursue that healing. And although I cannot maybe control all of my circumstances, I know I can control my response to the circumstance. Amen? So what is forgiveness? One, forgiveness is giving up your right. This is going to be the hard part. Forgiveness is giving up your right to hurt the person that hurt you. You give up the right to hurt the man, woman, whoever, neighbor, the relative, the ex. You give up your right to hurt the man or the woman that hurt you. You give up the right. I'm not going to seek their hurt. I'm not going to seek their pain. I'm not going to seek their destruction. I'm going to leave that to you. you. You saw everything what happened. Lord, you saw everything that happened. I'm going to give it to you. And at that moment you release the right to hurt them. That means if, a, if the enemy or anything presents to you an opportunity to hurt the person that hurt you, you're not going to bite that bait. You're not going to take that bait. You're not going to say, wow, what an opportunity to hurt them. What an opportunity to destroy them. I'm going to go for it. It'll destroy you. Everybody say amen. amen. Forgiveness does not diminish the wrong done against you. That doesn't, just because you forgave somebody for hurting you, that doesn't mean, oh, well, now... That means they are, whatever they did to you now is over in God's eyes. No, no, no. It doesn't diminish the wrong that they did. That's still there until they repent. Until that person goes to God and tells God, I hurt her. I hurt my child. I hurt my wife. I hurt my mother. I hurt my friend. Until they go to God, that, what, the wrong that they did is still hanging there over their head like the sword of Democles. Forgiveness doesn't diminish. A lot of people don't want to forgive. You know why? Because they feel that if I forgive you, you get scot-free. I'm giving you a free pass. It's like you never hurt me. If I forgave you, it's like you never did it. No, they did it. God knows they did it. And God knows exactly what to do with what they did. Okay. 
Number three, forgiveness is not a denial of what happened. Jesus didn't say, you didn't commit adultery. He said, I know you did. But I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, if anybody had the right to stone her, it's him. Because he was without sin. Nobody else had the right to stone her. He had the right. He gave up the right to destroy her. He, he let go. He released the right to kill her. And he said, you go. Don't do it again. Amen. Forgiveness is not a denial of what happened. When you forgive somebody, you're not denying that they did, they hurt you. They hurt you. And they will pay because whatever you sow, you will reap. The law of sowing and reaping is not diminished or destroyed when you forgive. Amen? Amen. Okay. Forgiveness is an act and a process. So when you forgive today, when you do that exercise I'm going to get you to do, you know, when you forgive or when you release that debt or when you cancel the debt, even if you do not have feelings of relief immediately, it will come because forgiveness is not a feeling. Don't look for a feeling. Some people will say, well, you know, I prayed and prayed and I don't feel that I've forgiven them. You know, I just, I, I, I don't feel a release. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a fact. Forgiveness is a fact. When God forgives you, you may not feel forgiven, but he's forgiven you. You've got to accept his word on that and move on. If God has forgiven you, then you accept God's word on it. You don't wait around for an emotion. What has your emotions got to do with unforgiveness at all? Or forgiveness? Forgiveness is a fact, not a feeling. Amen? Amen. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting. Just because you've forgiven someone, it doesn't mean you forget. But forgetting does not give you an excuse to talk about it to everybody. Forgiveness does not require you to hang out with the person you have forgiven. Now, I'm going to say this again. I'm not telling you to be mean or unfriendly or unchristian. But if you've forgiven someone that is not safe, you don't have to hang around with the unsafe person. So that they can just hurt you all over again. No. You just forgive and move on. You just smile and wave. No, I'm just kidding. You know, you see them in Walmart. Hey, hey, can we talk? No. I gotta go. Oh, but you know, can I call you? No. I've done it. I've done it. There's some unsafe people. I forgive them. Forgive them enough to wave and smile. Forgive them enough to, if they had a flat tire and I'd pass out, I might just help them out. They're in a hospital, I might visit. I don't want them in my life. I don't want to hang out, have lunch, and be buddy up with them and, and you know, follow them on Twitter or Facebook. I'm not going to do that. Oh, you know, now give me your Instagram. No. No. No, no, no. I don't want to do that. You're not safe. I want safe people in my life, even if it's just two people. Yeah, but you know why? Because you don't need 20 people to lift you up and pander to. You don't need 20 friends to make you feel good. You need two people. You just need two people. Two friends is more than enough. Oh yeah, one friend that will be courageous enough to expose my stupidity if I'm foolish enough to leave all this, the Holy Ghost, and walk away into the world, I need one friend that will come knock my door through and come and get me and shake me and take me to church and pray me through. That's a good friend. All right. Or that will be bold enough to tell me I'm wrong when I'm wrong. Yeah. The second friend is somebody that will just, you know, buy me a chocolate. You need that friend as well. You know, the one that will just surprise you with a box of chocolates. Even though that friend is really unsafe. <laughs> that friend's in my God. <laughs> you don't need, I mean, we all are like, oh my goodness, you know, you, you, she's got 5,000 followers. I was, really? Yeah. Isn't that cool? She's so popular. 5,000 followers. The other one's got 10,000 followers. Wow. None of them are going to come to my funeral. Yeah, I don't want them, 5,000, to come to my funeral. It's very expensive to feed them. I just want four people at my funeral. Four people, a little bit sandwiches, then go away. Funerals are expensive. I don't want 5,000. I'm sorry. 
That's a scary thought. Right? <laughs> Y'all are thinking, my goodness, they've invited a real nut this time. <laughs> and so this is, this is so important. You don't have to hang out with unsafe people. In fact, please don't hang out with unsafe people. Please don't hang out with people that will pander to your, to your ungodly lifestyle. That's unsafe. Don't hang out with people that will listen to your gossip and then repeat everything you've said and then add to the story to make it spicier. Okay. Don't hang out with people that will be eyeing, that will be making eyes. Open your eyes and wise up. Don't be hanging out with people that are just, you know, that they're, they're not living for God and they don't care you live for God. They're destructive. I'm sorry, but there are good people in this world and they're not so good people in this world. You need to discern. You don't have to hang out. Forgive? Yes. Hang out? Not necessary. I know. It is. Because it's in the word. Now, you know what forgiveness is, right? You have to acknowledge the hurt. Everybody say, I must acknowledge the hurt. That means you don't minimize or deny the wrong that was done against you and don't make excuses for the offender. He hurt you. It is there. It is what it is. He hurt you. Don't have to make, oh, well, he was having a bad day. Nobody cares. He hurt you. Okay? The next, say, cancel the debt. Say, acknowledge the hurt. Acknowledge the hurt. Cancel, the Cancel the debt. Take your paper. You've got a pen. If you don't have a pen, maybe you could borrow one. I want you to write down, and it may not be everybody here. I did this in my life. I want you to write down that which has happened. Whatever this person has done or whatever a group of people have done or whatever the circumstance, I don't care if you're mad with God, write it down. Write down what has happened. The thing that is hurting you, bothering you, disturbing your mind just over and over and you just can't let it go. And you try to let it go and it, and it goes away for a while but it comes back again. Things that trigger you. A, a, a particular person triggers you because you haven't really released that person's debt. Write it down. It's private. If anybody's looking on, uh, uh, on your shoulder to see what it is, smack them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't do that. Please don't. Then, you'll ha then they'll have to forgive you. And <laughs> Write it down. Do you know how many times I've written down on... This blank check, that's what I call it. It's a blank check. Blank check meaning they owe you a debt. And this is what I want you to write down. The name of the person, if you remember. If you, if you don't remember, that's okay. You, if, if you prefer to refer to them as a, in a relationship, in my uncle, my brother, whatever, that's fine too. And you can, the name of the person, they say, they owe me. You have to write that word, they owe me. What do they owe you? What have they done that they owe you? Write it down. Be brutally honest. Don't make excuses for anybody. That's how you deal with truth. This is truth. Accept the truth. Write a blank check. Look at the sin that has been committed against you as a debt. Someone has sinned against you and now owes you a spiritual debt. And like I said, you separate the spiritual debt from your anger. That's what you do when you write this down. Once you write it, you've written it down, hold it up. If you've written it down, just hold it up. Just hold it up towards heaven. Very good. Thank you for writing that down. Thank you for writing. Now, I want you to now pray. I'm asking you to pray. Can we stand? Don't put your pen away. There's one more thing that you need to do. I want you to stand, hold this up, and I want you to pray and ask God, God, I'm about to cancel this debt that is owed to me. That's what I want you to pray. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm about to cancel. I'm about to cancel this debt. It's hard for me to do because it's in my mind. I, I live with it. It's, a, it's not even stopped yet. Some of the stuff that you're going through, you might be living in that situation right now and the person hurts you every day or every week or you know, continuously. Father, I'm about to cancel the debt. And it's hard and I need your grace. I need your strength. I need the Holy Ghost to do it. Come on, church. Let's pray out loud. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm about to cancel this. I want to separate my anger from what they owe me. Because, Lord, I know that the law of sowing and reaping is eternal. It's an eternal law. Whatever they've sowed, they will reap. Whatever I've sowed, I will reap. And Lord, I do not want to sow unforgiveness anymore. I want, come on, everybody pray. I want to be healed. I want to be healed tonight of every blame and bitterness and hurt and anger. I want the healing of the Lord Jesus Christ to be poured on me. And as I cancel this debt, I know that you will heal me. You will. I believe that the Spirit of God is present in this place to heal me. Come on, pray that. I believe that your blood will wash my sins away. And as you hold that up, I want us to repent right now. What are we going to repent? They're the one who hurt you. They're the one who owes you. What are you going to? I'm going to repent for holding in bitterness and blame. I'm going to repent every time I've talked about it. Every time I've discussed it, in a, if not with a therapist or a pastor, but I've just talked to everybody about it. I want to, that, that I have um, carried a victim mentality and struggled with anxiety. I repent of that. Come on, church, everybody, all over, the, all over this house. Father, I repent of allowing this to cause me anxiety and depression, for allowing it to cause me fear. I repent, oh God. I ask your blood to wash right now i ask that you wash me in your blood cleanse me in your blood oh god for whatever i have held and held and held in my heart i've not been able to let it go it has given me sleepless nights it has ruined family gatherings it's ruined my relationship i just can't seem to let it go but father tonight i am believing in your name you are going to set me free you are going to release me from this debt that this person or the other person or this circumstance that, I, that owe me. Father, I include myself. If I cannot forgive myself, then I include myself in this blank check. If I'm the offender, I'm the one I cannot forgive, then I include myself in this. And it's, Father, there are certain things, Lord, I don't seem to be able to, to, to release and to forgive myself for some mistakes that I have made. I've made mistakes mistakes but I am writing that down if you have made mistakes and you cannot forgive yourself you put your name on this blank check as well because you're going to forgive yourself you're going to forgive yourself you're going to forgive others now take your pen take your pen and I want you to write right across right across whatever you've written on this blank check right across that in big letters over the names of the people that you've put there, over the sins they've committed against you, over whatever trespass or debt that they owe you. I want you to write the word big and bold, canceled. Write the word canceled. Canceled. And once you've written that word, once you've written the word canceled, I want you to bring that paper right up in front. This is your paper. You don't have to show it to anybody. This is personal. You know what I've done with my papers that I've canceled? They are in my Bible in some pages. Certain pages on forgiveness, certain pages on uh, love, certain pages on even hate. You know, scriptures on love or whatever. I, I put that in. And sometimes when the devil tries to lie to me and bring back awful memories and triggers me. I go back into the word of God. I go back into my Bible and pull out what I've canceled. I've canceled it, Lord. Thank you, God, for reminding me that I've made that step. Bring that paper up in front. Everyone, I want us to come. I know it's late. It's, it's, it's almost nine o'clock. 
It's almost nine o'clock. We're gonna we're gonna end soon. But I want us to bring our paper and I want us to lift up our hands because God is going to pour into you strength and peace because you've canceled. I want you to be real with God right now. Just cry out to God and be real with him. Father, you have canceled. I have canceled. Not you. Have, I have canceled whatever that's been owed to me. And right now I'm asking you for healing in Jesus name. You've canceled it. This is your door. This is your key to healing right now. You've done it. You've done it. God has watched you. Take that step of faith. God has observed. God has noted this down. He will honor you. Because you've taken that step of faith to no longer live in your past. You're going to reach for what is in front of you. You're not going to be bound by the past. You're not going to be tied by people that have tried to destroy you. Or people that have abandoned you. You're not going to be tied to individuals that have chosen to abandon you. To forget about you. Have abused you. But instead, you are going to be healed. Are you ready? They're going to worship God. They're going to sing. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm asking my precious friend here. I want her to lead whatever is in her heart. I want her to speak a word of faith. I'm coming to you right now to lay hands and pray for you. Okay, if you're a minister's wife, a pastor's wife, please come. I want you to help us pray in the name of Jesus. Could you come? Can, can we lay hands? Lay hands. If you're a pastor's wife, a minister's wife, a prayer warrior, I want you to take somebody by the hand right now and pray over them right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We release all bitterness. We release all bitterness. We release our shame. We release our unforgiveness against others and against ourselves. In the name of Jesus, we release that right now. You will be healed. You will be healed. You will forgive. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Release those things. In Jesus' name. I give this to you, God. I release this. I cancel this debt. In Jesus' name. Oh, yes. We will leave here different. We will not leave here carrying we will not leave here carrying this burden. We will not leave here carrying these debts. They don't belong to us. Oh, yes. Lift up your voices. Say out loud what you're releasing. Say out loud what you're canceling. Proclaim it with your mouth.
somebody beside you to pray with. Link up with somebody beside you.
somebody that have not that is not received the Holy Ghost there is a definite experience you will speak in the language of men and angels how powerful that is if you've not received God's power would you come very quickly in front please as quickly as you can if it's a friend of yours bring bring them right now thank you love can someone make, let's make a little bit I, I don't want you to stop praying some of you are praying it's powerful God is healing and delivering don't stop praying if you're praying for that stronghold or the or the healing to come keep praying I'm just I'm just wanting to focus just a little bit on those that have not received the whole I cannot go anywhere if people don't have the Holy Ghost I just can't sleep that night because <laughs> it's so powerful right ladies those of you have received it isn't that a life-changing experience come on Holy Ghost is life changing. Who doesn't know that? Right? Look at these beautiful ladies. Oh my goodness. I need some, I need some, I need some pastor's wife and minister's wives and other speakers for this conference to come help me pray with them. Could you come come on the platform and come this side? If you can. Where you at? What's your name, love? Leanne. You want the Holy Ghost? Leanne wants the Holy Ghost. I think God's gonna give Leanne the Holy Ghost. wants the Holy Ghost. God's going to fill it with a... Yes? We're going to believe. Yes. They're going to be born into the family of God. Right? So it's good to know their names, huh? Not just sister. <laughs> Leanne and Hannah. Who else? Joanna? Is Joanne? Joanne wants the Holy Ghost. Joanne's going to get the Holy Ghost. Anyone else? What's your name, love? Ingrid is going to receive the Holy Ghost. She's going to receive the Holy Ghost. There's more that way. Okay, you know what? Can we, if we can just scoot down just a little bit, and then there's also another, you know what? That, 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 those steps and these steps. How about sharing that? How's that? Thank you, Joanne. Leanne, would you go stand with Joanne? Thank you. No, you just stand right here. Okay, you're fine. What's, what, what's your, like, you know, I saw you standing there in the corner. You saw me looking at you, right? I saw you, and I saw you, and I thought, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, you need to go pray with her. I turned around and walked the other way and prayed, and then I thought, ah, oh, I hope she's not gone home. So 
So I came back here and I saw you walking up. Thank you for her. Thank you, Jesus. Blakely, it's a beautiful name. Blakely, you're going to get the Holy Ghost. Blakely, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Skyler, yeah. Why y'all have some nice names? Mine's just Bonnie. So it's nice too. Skylar, you're going to get the Holy Ghost, okay? All right, Skylar and Blakely. Anyone else? Anyone else want to join Skylar and Blakely? If you're right at the back and thinking, man, it's too crowded, I'm not going to go up, just come. Just push people away and elbow them. Get out of the way. I did that, you know, when I was young and, and I knew the Holy Ghost was moving and I, was, I didn't have the Holy Ghost then. I came from a Hindu background, didn't know anything about God, didn't know anything about Jesus. And I was like, people were so crowded in that place, I couldn't get up in front. So I literally elbowed some of them. I don't do that anymore. I've already got the Holy Ghost now, so I've changed. But that time I didn't have it. I was like, can you just... And then I went up in front and God filled me, this rude person. God is good. Amen. We're going to pray. The worship team is singing some awesome songs. And they're going to sing that song one more time. And we're going to lift up our hands. Those that want the Holy Ghost. Joanne, Leanne, you're right there. You're going to lift up your hands. Everyone, those that you want the Holy Ghost. That, that's it. Lift up your hands. Okay. That, that, hello, pretty girl in the pink. I know. Holy Ghost, not yet. All right, okay, that's fine. Just worship God anyway, okay? Just lift up your hands and worship God anyway. All right, everyone. Now repeat after me. Father, I repent of all my sins. I want your blood to wash me right now, and I know it does, because you promised that if I ask you for the Spirit, you will fill me with your Spirit. So I'm asking you for the Holy Ghost right now. Joanne, Leanne, Blakely, Skylar, Ingrid, Hannah. Yeah, remember your name. All right, now whole, the whole family of God is praying right now for them to receive the Holy Ghost. And you are going to receive the baptism. I need some people up here. If you've got, if you can believe, I need some altar workers right up here to pray with them. Come on. If you're a pastor's wife, a minister's wife, altar worker, pray a warrior. Come on up. Quick, just, come on up. Hallelujah. They're going to get the Holy Ghost. Some of them are all right. Whoa. Hannah, come closer. Hannah, you're going to be the first. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it even now in the name of Jesus. Right now, right now, right now, we declare. The power of God is in the room. Salvation is in the room. Miracles. Healing, deliverance. Right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. Right now, right now, right now.
breakthrough is in the room. Miracles are in the room. Whatever we need, whatever we need, it's here, it's here right now. Holy Ghost is here. The Holy Ghost is here. The Holy Ghost is here. You can have it right now.
worship in the room right now? Come on, thank Him for what He's done. Thank Him for what He's done in the place. Hallelujah. Lift up a sound of worship in the room right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. the wonderful presence of the Lord in this place tonight. And God is continuing to move.